Okay, thank you very much for the invitation to talk. Um, my, my talk is going to be more data intensive than model intensive. Um, I'm, I would suppose that the majority of you are not very familiar with glacier hydrology, so I'll use a chunk of the time here to introduce you to the complexity of the problem. Um, that'll be the uh, going on throughout, really, the, the presentation. Um, I will use examples from the field, from our work on the Bench Glacier and the Kennecott Glacier, and try to show you that what we're finding out about alpine glacier hydrology is indeed applicable to the outlet glaciers from Greenland. I'll be talking a bit about each of the components. I'll talk of, of the hydrologic system. Uh, I'll use some simple models, um, but I, I will end by emphasizing the challenges, and the challenges lie in uh, several aspects. One is the scaling, the hydrology of the glacier acts on sub-daily time scales, and yet as a geomorphologist I'm interested in the evolution of landscapes over many glacial cycles, so hundreds of thousands of years. How are we going to get between those, those scales? I'm not going to run my, my long time scale models on sub-daily time scales. Uh, I, I'll also um, uh, let me very quickly tell you the, uh, the components of the system. There are pieces of the system, in particular the snow melt part of the problem that's the source of the water for the glacial hydrologic system. That's essentially a Vados zone problem with all its complexities. But we're dealing with a substance that's vanishing as, it, as, as, its, as its hydrology changes too. So even the snow melt sort of source is a complicated part of the problem. Then the water gets into the glacier, um, by the, which, by the way, is opaque. <laughs> so we can't see it as it travels through. And it operates, it moves through it in pipes that are much uh, like karst systems, but the pipes can, can refreeze and, co and collapse by creep in the winter. So the whole hydrologic system has to be reborn each year. In addition, at the bed, there's motion of the, uh, at least in some glaciers, there's motion of the ice against the bed. That's a fault. So there's fault hydrology as well with all the attendant complexities of, of that. So th that's by way of warning about the complexity of the system. That because we can't see through it, we have to use proxy information about what the how the hydrologic system is operating. And part of that, part of the proxies for that are actually the sliding of the glacier, which responds to the water pressures at the bed. These are various motivations one, why one might want to understand glacier hydrology. You, you might be interested in, as a fluvial hydrologist, in the water output from the glacier and the time series of that, hydrograph of that, to drive sediment transport down the fluvial system. That's the coupling between the fluvial and the glacial systems. Uh, it turns out that the water transport through the glacier acts as essentially a heat source, can warm up the glacier, uh, which, has to, which, which can alter significantly the effective viscosity of the glacier, which allows it to speed up. This is one of the hypothesized sort of speed up mechanisms of the outlet glaciers of, of Greenland. I'm going to focus on sliding because I'm a geomorphologist interested in long time scale evolution of, of mountain ranges in the face of glacial ev uh, and interglacial variations. Um, and, and as I've said, we're going to use sliding as a proxy for telling us something about how the hydrologic system is working. One might be interested in the surges of glaciers as well, which are definitely associated with uh, blocking of the hydrologic system of the glacier for a while and then release of that water. Uh, anyone interested in eskers is worrying about how, how water moves at, at the base of the glacier. Uh, in addition, outburst floods, which, which can be the ride atop the glacial hydrology, the annual hydrology, um, you need to know about how the hydrologic system evolves. Well, this is a, just a, a, a way of advertising what we can do or what we'd like to be able to do is evolve mountain, uh, uh, glacial valleys from the dashed line to, to the, at present, the red line as glaciers come and go. But the time scale over which this happens is is thousands to tens of thousands of years. In order to do the sliding right, which causes the erosion, we have to do, we have to have a model for the hydrologic system, right? So 
So one of my points is going to be that these systems are distinct from many others and that the plumbing system collapses on an annual basis, maybe even, in fact, uh, it has much shorter time scales when the ice is indeed quite thick. And as I said before, we're finding that there are analogs between what we're finding on, an on alpine uh, glacial systems and uh, Greenland. This is an example of, of the complexity of a daily hydrograph. So snow melt happens during the day and, and the system goes to sleep at night, reborn during the day during snow melt. But this is the, pardon me, this is the surge, Let's hang on. Let me go back. Uh, so this is a video taken of a time-lapse image taken of the variegated glacier in Alaska. And you can see the surge coming around the corner, right? So the ice is, has, is accelerating it right here. It's going about a meter per day. Up here it's doing 30 meters per day. And there's all kinds of nifty ice tectonics that goes on in this compressional uh, mountain range that's happening in real time here. Okay, so in order to understand how the surge works, we would need to know how the hydrologic system in the glacier works. Uh, yeah, we better go get this camera. <laughs> Quick. Obviously we did, right? Like, we better do it real soon. There we go. Okay. So this is an illustration of the kind of hydrograph one gets. This is the water input into, in, into the glacier. Actually, it's the water output from the glacier. Pardon me here. Um, water output from the glacier. And notice that over the course of the season, not much, there's not much in the way of daily oscillation at, at first. And then it gets to be significant daily oscillations in, in the water discharge from the glacier. That has to do with the daily oscillations of the uh, snow melt at the surface. Early going, in the early going, there's not, there, mo much of the melt that is occurring is going into the snowpack and warming up the snowpack so that it can ultimately release that water as melt into the glacier. The components of the glacier system include the snow melt at the surface, which is occurring on, on snow that, that varies in thickness from uh, significant up here to at least late in the season to no snow down here. So you're just melting ice, it's going into the subglacial, into the end glacial system and ultimately feeding the subglacial system. The subglacial, so in general, we often see this, that the melt rate exceeds the output hydrograph. Early, at least early going, that's certainly the case when, this, when the water is simply going into the snowpack and warming up the snowpack so that the output hydrograph would be low. Even if it's not just going into the snowpack, but going into the hydrologic system, early in the season, the hydrologic system is all closed up because it, it, had, uh, it had 200 days to creep closed during times of no snow melt so that the pipe system has gone away. No pipe system, you're putting water into the top, there's very low efficiency of transport of that water through the glacial system, and therefore what water does get in, there's, there's a significant uh, difference between the melt inputs and the water outputs from the glacier. That means the storage in the glacier is going up. That raises water pressures and promotes sliding. So we see what's called a spring event associated with this um, mismatch between inputs of water and outputs of water. Components of the surface system include channels on the surface, which in themselves are beautiful. beautiful look, look at this meandering system on, on the Root Glacier in Kennecott. One thing that's different about the surface system is that uh, it disappears in holes. These are moulins that provide water input to the end glacial and subglacial system at points. So the, the, the water that is in a distributed way being produced on the surface gets input into the subsurface at points. So far that's not been taken into account in, in glacial hydrologic models. One of those places where the surface system gets interrupted is in crevasses, which ultimately lead to, um, to moulins. The end glacial system is all I'm going to say about it. It's hard to see. <laughs> we can drill holes in the glacier when we, we count up the numbers of voids that those holes 
uh, uh, intersect, it looks like the porosity of the ice is something like 1 to 2 percent. It's very low porosity substance. And that'll translate into very, very reactive um, uh, uh, oscillation of the water table within the glacier because it's so low porosity. Um, th and that, in turn, will translate into variability in the water pressures. OK, the subglacial system very likely looks something like this. And we talk about it as having a slow system and a fast system. The fast system is a set of conduits which ultimately exit the glacier at, at one or to two outlet, glacier, outlet uh, rivers. The slow system is a set of interconnected cavities which are simply riding back behind bumps as the glacier slides across the bed. It opens up voids back behind those bumps and those voids develop some interconnectivity. Um, so here's motion from left to right over a complicated bed gives rise to to a set of cavities which interconnect through thinner orifices. This view of the subglacial system put forth by CAM is nicely illustrated when we look at deglaciated beds. And Hari Rajaram here in the, in the uh, Civil Engineering Department has done work on the hydrology of faults that shows the anisotropy of the transmissivity of the, of the subglacial system or the, of a fault system. If you fault with sliding left to right, you open up voids that tend to connect in a transverse way. <clears throat> it's also analogous to, and the evolution of that fault system might well be analogous to, or fault hydrologic system, it might well be analogous to what happens in a, in a karst system, where in the case of karst, you're dissolving the walls in the case of of the subglacial plumbing system, you're melting the walls. And the melt rate goes as the discharge of water. So as the water discharge increases, the melt rate increases, developing bigger and bigger pipes, which compete for the water, ultimately leading to a few raining pipes that are interconnected with these uh, spotty uh, sort of cavities. But all of this happens underneath an opaque substance so let me tell you about how we use proxy information from, from glaciers themselves, uh, in particular how fast they go, as a means of telling us something about the subglacial system. So we've gone to work on, on the bench glacier shown here in May and here in July. Uh, and one of the first things that we, we saw on the bench glacier was, was that there is a spring speed up event that tends to happen on an annual basis where much of the sliding of the year takes place in short order. And this is told, the story is told by GPS monuments we can tack to the ice surface or traveling with the ice surface. We can tell their horizontal position and their vertical position with the three GPS coordinates. Um, this is the raw data. I've taken out of that raw data the background speed which is associated with internal deformation of the ice any variation in that speed has to be sliding at the bed. You're not going to change the viscosity of the ice on short term, so that has to be sliding. So this bottom plot is a plot of the displacement time series associated with sliding. And you can see that there are a couple events, one that gets it going here, and then a big event here. Uh, complicated plot, I'm not going to go into the detail, but you can do that for various GPS monuments on the, on the ice surface. Each one of it shows an event um, that starts it off and then a big event and then it goes quiet. Uh, so here's the speed, the derivative of the displacement. And this is the vertical coordinate. The vertical looks like there's significant displacement. It's, it's displaced vertically by 20 centimeters at, at GPS Monument 3. And then as soon as the sliding stops, note that the vertical comes back to bed parallel. I've taken out the bed parallel motion. So this is actually uplift of the ice surface. Uh, the first event looks like it translates up glacier. And then the second event is essentially ice, I, isochron, isochronous at, this, at, this, um, at the, um, the same time at each of the GPS monuments, and it's associated with a very actually hot winds that came up valley. Most winds on glaciers come down valley. This really put a lot of water into the glacier, and it sped up and then went quiet. 
despite the fact that, that it, uh, the air temperature remained high. Notice that the water discharge took a big leap upward at this point and then stays high. What that tells us is that the subglacial drainage system, the conduit system, has been put in place during that big input of water. And at that point, you have an efficient bleed of, of water and hence water pressure out of the system and the glacier has done its, its sliding. Right. So notice the time scale for the decay of the uplift of the, of the ice surface is on the order of about eight days. This is in fact about the time scale we would expect for collapse of the cavity of voids at the bed if water had simply been taken out of those voids. Given the thickness of the ice that we know from radar, it would take about eight days to collapse. So here's my poor man's animation of this. Right? Here's a GPS monument tacked to the ice surface. It's going upward. Hang on, let me go backward here. So it's tacked to the ice surface, so it's both going horizontally and vertically with the ice as voids get created at the bed. But, but now the water pressure, water has bled out of the system because conduits have been put in, and now the ice surface is, is going back to bed parallel. So the pieces of physics include the growth and decay of cavities at the bed. The growth is associated with sliding times the thickness of the, times the height of the step in the bed. There's a possibility of melting of the cavity walls due to translation of water through it. And then here's the collapse. And importantly, the collapse goes as the ice pressure minus the water pressure to the end power. N is the, is the uh, rheologic component, uh, uh, exponent. So it goes as the cube, it's a nonlinear rheology, so that the strain rates go as the cube of the stress. That's where the end comes, and you can see that if I drop the water pressure significantly, then the collapse rate's gonna be dictated by the ice pressure, so rho GH, the thickness of the ice, cubed. So the thicker the ice, you double the thickness of the ice, it is, the collapse rate ought to go up eightfold, right? And we can actually use that to model the data, um, and, and we can do quite well modeling the, the vertical uplift and decay of that uplift with this both sourcing of, of a cavity source by, by sliding and subsequent collapse after water pressure is taken out. The, cat, the conduits have the same physics, effectively, the rate of change of the, of the cross-sectional area of the conduit goes as the melt rate, and here it's driven by the water, the melt rate of, uh, due to water translating through the, the conduit, and then again, same physics behind the creep closure of the, of the conduit. So one can link all of these elements together. Mark Kessler and I this, did this a few years ago, linking a, an algorithm for cavities which are linked to a conduit which uh, starts at essentially a minimal conduit at the beginning of the season. And I'm simply gonna show you the animation of that. We get this rug flap-like speed up which translates up glacier um, as, as the conduit gets e more and more efficient. It bleeds off that water pressure and stops that, that sliding from, from occurring. Just as in advertisement, we see the same kind of, of uh, rug flap-like sliding history on some of the outlet glaciers in Greenland. This is simply a uh, compilation of sliding histories for many years on an outlet glacier uh, on the west side of, of Greenland. Uh, each one of these gray lines is a, is a sliding history. <clears throat> Let me go on to the other experiment we've worked on, which is the Kennecott Glacier. So from the bench glacier, 200 meters thick, uh, had a decay time for those cavity closures of order eight days. Go to the Kennecott Glacier, it's twice as thick or so. It ought to collapse and be much more um, uh, reactive to variations in melt. We didn't see much in the way of, very, of daily oscillations in, in sliding on, on the bench glacier. What's gonna happen on the Kennecott? One of the cool things about the Kennecott is it has this, this blocked drainage here which results in Hidden Creek Lake being dammed up by the glacier itself. Um, another cool thing is that it's got Donahoe Falls Lake right here which acts effectively as a manometer in the system um, which fills during the outburst flood from Hidden Creek Lake as it travels through a tunnel 15 kilometers between here and the terminus. 
So here's the water coming out uh, at McCarthy over a steel bridge we can mount uh, stage gauges to. And um, here's Joe Walder out in a boat sounding Hidden Creek Lake. So that study was done in the early 80s and showed that, that their, their target was trying to understand the hydrology of, uh, of an, an outburst flood, which happens on an annual basis here. This is Donahoe Falls Lake right here at the crook between the tribu main tributaries. It's dry on this day. The next day it looks like this. All right, so 45 meters of water of, that's clearly subglacial water fills this lake for a day and then it drains again. This is Hidden Creek Lake before and just after the flood, 100 meters of water, 30 million cubic meters of volume is lost in a day through the flood. And this is the stage graph from, from a pressure transducer in, the, in Hidden Creek Lake and here is the, the deduced hydrograph of water input into the lake, in, in, sorry, into the glacier. Here's the output hydrograph in blue and uh, Kennecott River. And, and you can see there's a translation. It took about a day to get from the input to the output, 15 kilometers. And along the way, Donahoe Falls Lake in that little crook goes high, stays high, and goes low. It acts as a little pressure gauge. OK, here's the pressure as it comes by. So we went out there a couple years later and said, well, what's the response of the glacier to this outburst flood that hadn't been studied? So we put out GPS monuments, one, two, three, four, five. We put in pressure gauges in Donahoe Falls Lake, Hidden Creek Lake, Erie Lake, and measured the output hydrograph. Same kind of thing uh, in the, in the um, record of GPS motion. Uh, here is the, uh, the displacement associated with the flood. You take out, these are the raw data, you take out the sliding, you can see how much is accomplished. Four meters of motion during the flood. Very complicated plot, same kinds of variables that, that we talked about before. Well, I'm going to jump to the next slide, which has an animation of the data that I hope you find illuminating. I'm a Mac. I know you're a Mac. Help. Somehow it jumped. I just, you were there? I just need to point to uh -oh. That was there. there. Okay, here we go. go. All right, animation of the data. So here's the here it is in real space. Here this is, is Tim Bartholomew's animation. So here's the hydrograph, uh, sorry, the stage record in Hidden Creek Lake, Donahoe Falls Lake, and the terminus in proper order. This is a GPS monument. We're seeing the X Y motions of that monument. We put it in on Mother's Day, and then went back to school. So for for uh, a month here, we'll just see the Mother's Day GPS. And you can see there's a significant oscillation on a daily basis, even at this time of year in May. Donahoe Falls Lake has actually dropped in stage. Since we put in a, a, a stage gauge here, we hadn't gotten up to Hidden Creek Lake. We'll do that in another couple days when Tim gets back into the field. So we've got 10 days of running record of the hydrograph. OK, he's back in the field, got GPS 2 put in, which is right adjacent to Donahoe Falls Lake. Got in the next day and to put in GPS 1. Notice even now you see the difference in the background speed. It's thinner ice down here, thicker ice up here. So the speed, now he's got GPS 4 and 5 in, and he put in the, high, the, the pressure gauge in Donahoe Falls Lake. Donahoe Falls Lake, is the stage is rising as water is put into it down this river. The, the, interestingly, the da daily oscillation of these, of these monuments is big at some times and small at others. Donahoe Falls Lake has, has drained. It's now uh, below the sensor. Nice, big oscillations of of da daily oscillations of speed now. Donahoe Falls Lake is topping up, just about to drain. Here it goes. Big, big response of the glacier during that outburst flood. It, there went the flood past Donahoe Falls Lake, and out it came at the terminus. Okay, so that kind of data 
can be used. We, this, is, this is the kind of thing you publish in JGR. You don't publish the, the animation, unfortunately. But we could see, uh, for example, here's just a few days before and then the flood itself. You can see the down glacier translation of the speed up as the water moves its way down the glacier. Okay, so we basically find that in both daily and annual and seasonal time scales, you see sliding when there's a greater input of water into the system than output of water in the system. If I have a couple more minutes, I want to show you an analogy, thinking about that daily oscillation. Let me think about that from the point of view of a porous material. This is uh, from, from uh, Moore and, and Neil Iverson's work out in geology. He, they, they were shearing a granular medium, and they had pressure transducers in, the, in, this, in this medium and were very carefully monitoring the horizontal displacement. What they saw and I found interesting was that uh, when you got displacement events, as soon as you got a displacement event, the poor water pressure went down. That's because you dilate the material as you shear it. Well, that's quite analogous to what's happening underneath the glacier where when you slide, you create cavities. Those are effectively the pores in the glacier system. We can, we can quantify that by, uh, you see I'm about to be yanked off this stage, we can quantify that by the same kind of system where we basically have a model for the generation of cavity space back behind these, these elements in the bed, roughness elements in the bed. It, it's a relatively straightforward calculation just analytically to show that the rate of change of sliding speed should go as minus the sliding speed. And that's because as you, as you create pore space, you draw that, you fill that water, that pore space with, but with water from the glacier, which pulls down the water table, which decreases the pressure, which therefore slows down the sliding. And the time scales for this negative feedback are indeed on big glaciers on the order of a day. Okay, so I'm gonna s stop there and simply say that there's much left to do uh, on all of the components of the system and that formal linking of those systems is gonna be challenging when we wanna cross from sub-daily to glacial cycle kinds of time scales. Okay, thank you. <laughs>